Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's nice to see a lot of our young ones here. Miss Johnson smiling. It's nice for us to come together. What a beautiful weather for those who like the sun. Uh, I, you see, I'm from the countryside, and um, where I live actually in the morning is very cool. So forgive me if I don't enjoy a very hot day like Myron does. <laughs> um, thanks, I listened to your message, Myron, because I, I, I wanted to be sure that I'm not repeating some of the thoughts that you shared last week, but um, inadvertently there might be some repetition, but somebody says that repetition deepens what? Deepens impression, right? Right? I can see the heat is not doing some of us too well. <laughs> <laughs> but vitamin D is vitamin D's always good for us. Um, Lord, we pray for your guidance today. Amen. Thanks uh, from the heart. Very powerful song um, about our Father. So I'm going to spend some time teaching today. And if I get a bit excited at the end, don't forgive me. Um, because sometimes we kind of take a closed shop view on the, um, the three angels' messages, and we have this concept about the three angels' messages that sometimes we don't focus on what the issue is actually about. Um, so so the, the, the issue of the story um, in, in Revelation 14, and we're going to go there in a minute, um, it, it's, it's a matter of sin. It's a matter of what? sin. And the response that you give and I give will determine our and our spiritual well-being. So when we see a brother or sister in sin, there are two responses that um, one of two things we can do. First, we do not know why they're there. Or what caused them to be there. So we can either be critical or we can be supportive. Not of the sin, but to help the brother, the sister to come out of that situation that he or she finds him or herself in. The, 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 the dilemma that we have, the dilemma that we have with sin, and think about this, sin is like a, a crocodile, right? A massive crocodile. And um, before you know it, sometimes you find yourself between a rock and a hard place. Um, and before you know it, you, you then recognize that once sin comes into your space, is that sin divides. Remember, remember the story of Adam and Eve, right? The Bible says they were okay until sin came. Then Adam started arguing with Eve, and Eve started arguing with. And since that day, there's been arguing between Adam and Eve, and Eve and Adam. And we, call, we don't call it sin anymore. We call it a dispute, right? And if you go to the divorce court, it's called irreconcilable differences. But the fact is that sin is a what? Is a divider. The second point is sin is a, you need to talk back to me, come on. Sin is a what? It's a deceiver. Remember David? David should have gone fighting. Instead, he stayed home. Sometimes staying home is not a good idea. Stayed home, and then he found himself bedding Bathsheba, and we call it adultery. Nowadays, they don't call it adultery. They call it an alternate lifestyle. So you have, you have poly, polyamorous relationships. Um, you have, I'm trying to find these multiple words that they use. It's not called sin anymore. It's called choice. Fluid, the fluidity. I saw a very strange one the other day 
Um, but then we'll come back to that. So sin is a what? It's a deceiver. Remember that man Samson, right? Samson, strong. Samson was like, like you know, he got so much strength that he, that he would lift gates. He had so much strength, he, would, he could take his hands and just rip lions apart. But when he comes on to the fairer sex, he had no strength. Um, and so he found himself building the Philistines' kingdom. He was supposed to be a defender of Israel, but instead he found himself what? Building. Um, we call it folly, not sin anymore. It's, it's, it's folly. And, 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 and this is what, and, and those people who believe in evil, they said there's no such thing as sin. There's something that is called evil, but we'll come into that later on. But finally, sin is what? Deadly, Deadly right, yeah. Um, and that's why Jesus found himself on a blooded cross. Uh, we don't call it um, sin, we call it sacrifice. And, and, and by the way, by the way, since, since Adam and Eve um, committed um, that atrocity, all of us, all of us have been scarred and marred by this cancerous disease. And not even Ben Carson, who has the ability to separate Simon's twin, can separate you and I from sin. I have a friend, she's a neurosurgeon, and she performs brain surgery. Uh, she, she's fantastic. She knows what she's doing. But not even the skills that she possesses is able to separate any one of us from sin. The story is told of a child. The story is told of a child. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the story before. The mother put a cookie jar on the table and says, do not touch the cookies. And she says, mother, cross my heart. I won't touch it. You know the story. Mother went away, came back, and mother counted the cookies, and cookies were missing. Spoke to the child, what happened? The devil pushed me into the cookie jar. Don't believe what you're hearing. We, nobody in this church is sinless. Nobody. The Bible says, read with me, for what? All have what? Sinned and what? And those of us who are short have sinned more than those of us who are told. So that's why I like to do the Sabbath school with Johnny, because he's, he's taller. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we need somebody righteous to support the sinner, don't we? So we, we have this idea that, that there are some of us who are living closer to God. Those, you know, because we pray daily, we read God's word daily, where we have Holy Spirit lives. But, but I want to, and I hope you're taking these texts down. Um, this is, I'm going to read from the Message Bible, and then you can read from the King James Version. It says, um, we are all sin-infected, sin contaminated. Here's this now. Our best effort are greased, stained rags. We dry up like autumn leaves, sin dried. We're blown off by wind. Now the King James Version says it better. It says what? All our what? Righteousness are like what? Filthy rags. Let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. All of us are strugglers. Come on now. Uh, no matter how pristine white we, we seem to be, no matter how, how righteous we seem to be, all of us, we are strugglers. We, we may not admit this out loud for fear that the righteous will persecute us and will prosecute us. Um, it's hard being a child of God, uh, but the greatest choice that you can make is to live for Jesus. 
Living for God is one of my most joyous experience. Sticking with Him has been my most fruitful encounter. Letting go of God, regardless of my sinful state, I will not let go until I receive God's blessings. The truth is, our, our struggle against sin is a huge clue that God is still working on our hearts. Let's go. Remember, we cannot out sin the grace of God. God has never abandoned his children. I say amen for that. Amen. Let's see what Proverbs 34, 6 says. And the Lord, what? Passed by him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, what? Merciful and, and gracious, what? Long-suffering and? Have you experienced the goodness of God? There is a controversy that is raging. It is raging inside and outside. We are caught in the middle. Often when the Bible talks about sinners, it is in contrast to righteous. Spend some time digging into the text. And every time it talks about sinfulness, it talks about righteousness. Remember Noah? The Bible says that the world was evil and everybody was doing bad things, but Noah what? Found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And yet still, after finding grace, having been saved by Jesus from the mighty flood, we find Father Noah having too much to drink. And he found himself drunk. Didn't Jesus reference righteousness with sin? Remember he talked about on one side we have the sheep and the other side we have the then he talks about the wise virgin and the foolish. Those on the left, those on the left, and those on the right. He talks about righteousness in light of sin. Remember Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 when the people say um, he's spending time with what? Sinners, he said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but to call sinners Remember Paul himself in Romans 7, read when you have time, he referenced this concept of sin and righteousness. Paul says, each time I try to do good, I'm confronted with what? With wrong. And he says, oh, wretched Paul that I am, who can save me from my sinfulness, my sinful state? You see, you see, my friends, Revelation 14 is couched within the context of those who are striving to be righteous and those who continue to live in sin. But here is what I love what Paul says. Paul says in Romans 5 verse 20, read with me, where sin what? Abounds, grace... Don't tell me that you have to live in sin. Don't tell me that you have to continue to do the wrong. Somebody says, Pastor, I can't help myself. Have you heard it? I just have to do it. The truth is, the truth is God wants to restore us. He wants to save us. He wants to give us a new mind and a new heart. God wants to reset the world. God wants to remove sin from our lives. God wants to make us righteous. He wants us to live and not experience pain, disappointment, suffering, and death. To this, to this he has to examine uh, us. God wants to examine us. The, the examination comes in the part of judgment. Let us hear what, what Solomon, and he understood what this meant. I know it's very small. I didn't realize it was that small. I can't even see it from this distance. But anyway, go there. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 17. I said, in, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there's, for there's a time there for every, every activity So there is, write this down, my friends. If you have your mobile phone, young people, flash it on Facebook. Or if you're on Snappy Chat, put it there. Write this down on Instagram. Let the world know that judgment is coming. It is coming, whether you like it or not. 
it is coming. It's a solemn fact. One day in the distant future, you and I will have, will have to give God an account as to how we have lived our lives. God will be separating the sheep from the goats. He'll be splitting up the righteous from the unrighteous. He'll be sorting out the godly from the godly. Those who are with Christ will be on one side, and those who are not with him will be on the other side. Judgment is coming. Judgment is the process by which God intervenes in the history of humanity. Judgment is coming. Fake news is swamping the world. There'll be no judgment. Can I say this to you? That this is a lie from the pit of hell. And by the way, people like to publish fake news, repost it, um, and they like to replicate it. And if you don't think for yourself, suddenly a lie becomes a truth. Did I say judgment is coming? God's judgment will arrive, and all things on this earth will be shaken. Everything will be exposed. Everything, even our lives. We, we need divine judgment. We need divine judgment. Unless God comes and judge this world, we are in serious trouble. We need divine judgment to break the shackles of oppression, lose the chains of depression, and open the prison of domination, because those who have power are controlling the world, controlling your lives, and deciding how you live. But judgment is coming, and this will not be the judgment of um, Putin or, or the judgment of Biden. It will be the judgment of the divine God. But you know something? You will have to give an account, and I will have to give an account. You see, unless God brings judgment, uh, sin will control the world. Unless God brings judgment, the environment will be stained by sin. Unless God brings judgment, our relationships will always be fluctuating between, between good and bad. Uh, unless God brings judgment, the world will be destroyed by man. But when God brings judgment, it is not for the destruction. I'm talking about executive judgment of God. It is not for the destruction of the world. It is for the restoration of that which we have lost. Hallelujah. Amen. Fake news is taking over the world. But here's, here's the text. Let's go. For, for, for we, must, we must what? All appear before what? that everyone may receive the things done in his what? According to that he had done, whether it be what? I, I had a grandmother, and she had a belt called judgment. Well, that's what we call it. And once I did all the things I should do, and once I followed the path I should follow, I never experience judgment. Oh, I did. I did because I was walking the path. And so her judgment then was a mix, mixture of a good judgment. But when I went off the trail, and many of you sitting here looking at me, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe those of you who are living in a modern Britain where to, where to receive judgment is, is to sit on the naughty step. In my days, there were no naughty steps. Pete is smiling. He knows what I'm talking about. Let me, let me say something. God sends rain upon the just and on the unjust. God will bring judgment upon the just and upon the unjust. 
but, but in, in, in bringing uh, judgment, and I'm going to close with that bit, he brings mercy. You see, mercy and judgment are two coins uh, of the same, uh, two sides of the same coin. We, we often talk about the, 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 the mercy side of God, the love of God, um, uh, but if we declare God as being merciful, uh, we still have to proclaim that he also brings judgment. Let me share an example to help you understand the connection between mercy and judgment. If you're on trial for murder, for example, and the jury came back with a verdict of not guilty, would you then throw yourself on the mercies of the court? I'm sure you'd walk away rejoicing. There's no need for mercy without a guilty verdict. Are you with me? There's no need for mercy without judgment or, or the threat of judgment. So here is John. He's on the Isle of Potmos. I'm going there. Here he is on the Isle of Potmos, John. You know John. He spent time with the Savior, John. John was known as the son of thunder, John. John was a filthy mouth guy who was a fisherman, John. Who, when he met the Savior, experienced mercy. And here he is, John, uh, exiled on the Isle of Potmos. And he gets a message from an angel. Here we go, read with me. Then, he, then I saw, he said, I saw another angel, what? Flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting to preach unto them that dwell on the world and to every nation, tongue, and kindred, saying with a loud voice, fear God and what? Judgment is, is coming. All of us will stand before Christ's judgment seat. Not one will be missing. How vast an assembly at the judgment seat of Christ. There will be a great revelation. Judgment is coming. You, you, your, your character will be placed under the judgment bar of God. Not just your character. Uh, judgment is coming, uh, but also um, God will place uh, your condition. How? Shall we stand on that great day? And also your uh, life story will be examined by God. So um, I, I came to church the other day and I parked at the front of the church. The back tire touched the yellow line. And when I came, having done Sabbath school, I had to contain myself <laughs> because thoughts of unrighteousness and what I would do with the ticket man for just giving me a ticket because just, it's, just, it's just the back tire. And what he did was um, half of the car was fully in, but the back tire was just grazing. And so I appealed, and they said, sorry. And I reappealed, and they said, sorry. So I said, I'm, I'm going to go before the judge. And, and, and I'm told that their decision is final. So um, I decided not to have a paper appeal, because he's going to look at the facts. So I decided to have an in-person appeal. Are you with me? Yes. Uh, and, um, and, and so I decided that it's too far to drive, so I'll have him on the phone. And so he called me at 10.30 on Wednesday morning. And, and, and he started out by saying, I've lost the case. He said, there's nothing you can tell me because according to the law, your tire touch the yellow line. And I said, it's just grease, greasing it, trying to use my gym. I said, it's just brushing it. He said, I don't understand what that means. I said, um, it's just, just touching the edge. He said, according to the law, if your tire touches the line, you are guilty. By now, the charge was 193 pounds. 
Sister Sharon's bank account was about to go down <laughs> in value. But then something, somebody says to me, by the way, he said it, we are parked in a CPZ zone. And I, uh, I, said, I said, there's no sign. There's no sign. I, I'm going to make an application. I, he said, there is no sign. He, he, he says, he said, the council said, there is a sign. So he says, right, take me along the route you travel. So I came down Wilmin Road. Windmill Road comes across White House Road. White House Road comes to North Cut Road. And the CPZ stopped right there. So I said to him, I'm not, I'm actually on Selhurst Road. He said, let me travel the journey with you. And, and he, he took me on the journey. And he says, there is no CP zone in that area. He says, you have won. We shall be made manifest. Life's secret will cease. Successful deception will be successful no more. All veils and disguise will be turned off. The world as we see it now, we won't see it the same way. Listen to me. Man's judgment is confined to what they see and what they know. And let me tell you something. Some of us, we come to church and people think we're ready for the judgment. But many of us, people who don't expect us to be ready for the judgment, we are are ready. The fact is that man looks on the outside. But God looks on the inside. And when man is merciless, God is merciful. Judgment is about a decision. It's the notion of evaluation. Judgment is about acquittal or condemnation. Judgment is about being innocent or guilty. Let me tell you about human judgment. It's about the mighty and the rich. It's about having power and control. And sometimes, even in this country, judgment is colorblind. I can tell you stories of people who found themselves in serious trouble because of the color of their skin. I can tell you about people who have found themselves in serious trouble because their bank balance is just too low. I can tell you about people who have found themselves in trouble and, and judgment came because uh, of, of their education level is not where it should be. But let me tell you about divine judgment. God's judgment is about to fix the problem that we all face on a daily basis. God's judgment is about cleaning out the mess, removing the junk, putting the world right back. It's about caring for the oppressed and looking after the forgotten. God's judgment is coming. For the time is coming that judgment, but here we go, and this is where I'm going to finish my sermon, here we go, because quite often we think that the judgment in Revelation 14 um, should be about those who are not outside of the household of faith, but what does the word say? That judgment, for the time is coming, that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it begins... And us, what shall be what? The end of them that obey not the gospel of God. Are you listening to me this morning? Judgment begins in the house of God. God has appointed a time when judgment will begin in this church. A poll was conducted somewhere, and four out of five people believe that there's some divine judgment that is coming. So watch the angel, the Bible says, the Bible says that the angel of God is not moving slowly, but is moving swiftly. He's coming with a message. He's saying to the members of Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church and our many viewers online, saying to us that judgment begins in the house of God. This is what the servant of the Lord says. Read with me. Division will come what? In the church. Two parties will be what? The wheat and the tears grow up together for the judgment begins in the house of, of God. 
I read this quotation, there will be a what? A shaking of the sieve. The shaft must, must in time be what? Because iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. It is the very time when the genuine will be what? Judgment is coming in the house of the Lord. So here's my problem. And here's your problem. That many of us, we are doers. We have a doing culture in the church. We, we, we enjoy doing things. Uh, so, what, 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 so, Pastor, what do we do? Uh, and because we're doers, quite often we do not commit what I call the sin of commission, you know? The sin of commission where we deliberately commit sin. But many of us, including myself, we commit what I call the sins of omission. So, he, uh, oh, Pastor, I'm going to explain that in two minutes. Uh, pastor, doesn't the Bible say that we should do? Blessed are they that do is what? This is a favorite text we call, blessed are they that do is what? Commandment that they may have a right to the tree of life and may what? Enter into the gates, into the city. Yes, Paul, I mean, James says that we must be doer of the word of God. Yes, we must do the right thing. Yes, we, we, must, we must do, we must, we must do the Ten Commandments. But, but here is what Paul rushed to say. Paul says, for by what? Graced are ye what? Saved through faith. And this is not of your own. Yes, you cannot do of your own. It is what? Not result of what works so that no one will boast. We have become doers in the church of God. We have become doers. Many of us, we do uh, dress reform. And so once the dress is long, we're okay. Doers, just make sure it's long enough. We do evangelism, right? We do Bible study. Once I'm doing some sort of Bible study, I'm okay. Um, we do music reform. Once there's no drum in the church, it's okay. And when we talk about music reform, it's the lack of having a, a drum in the church. Everything else is okay, but just the drum, it's evil. Oh, by the way, I'm not, I'm not preaching to say drum is not wrong or drum is not right. Just making a point, because I know I'm going to be stoned at the end of this. Uh, we, and I'm, I'm happy with that. We do vegetarianism reform. Um, one member told me, Pastor, if you're not a vegetarian, you're going to hell. Uh, we do tithe reform. Pastor, I'm a faithful tithe giver. Uh, some of us, we do prayer reform. We, are, we go to every single prayer meeting. We, we, we do because we think by doing, we are going to be saved. But here's a, here is something that the spirit of prophecy, I've always heard it, and I said, let me dig deep. Let me dig deep. Um, Elder Peter, let me dig deep. Let me dig deep. Here we go. Come read with me. Some of you might not want to read it, but... It's an uncomfortable reading. But here we go, here we go. It says what? It is what? That I make that not one whose names are upon the church are to close there and would be as verily without and without in the world as the common Oh, that's, okay, that's her point. Here's my point. They are serving God, but they are more earnestly... Did you hear that? Did you hear what she's saying? She's saying, Sister Zulu, she's saying 
that it's not what you do that makes you ready to face the judgment of God. Oh, you, oh the church is quiet on me now. That's, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. You know, we, 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 are, we, are, we are the great pretenders in the house of God. So, so we can come to church and, and preach holy, holy on Sabbath morning. And then we go home, and the, and the home is in turmoil. The great pretender. Uh, we can go to many prayer meetings, and, and we use prayer meetings as a kind of gossip. Let's pray for Sister Black because she committed sin. Am I talking to somebody this morning? Uh, we have this very um, pretentious ability to, to do things because, because, because if I'm going to get ready, um, Elder P, I, I'm going to have to do what, what must be done so that, so that I am going to be saved. But, but, but some of us and many of us, including myself, we, 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 we pretend to be righteous, but, 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 but quite often the relationship with ourselves and God, we are so disconnected from the source of strength. Uh, uh, we are pretending. We are fully clothed on the outside, but, but inside we are not what we are supposed to be. But you know what I like about God? And this is the, the message of Revelation 14, 6, 6 to 7. The Bible says, give me another five minutes and I'll close, seriously. Uh, let's go. The Lord is not what? Concerning is, as some men count, but is what? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to? You know, Pastor Braham who watches this every Sabbath, he'll say to me, sometimes you hit the brethren too hard. He says, where is hope? Well, Pastor Abraham, there is hope. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise that some men count slackness, but he is what? Long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should what? Perish, but that all should come to? It doesn't matter if you are doing church. It doesn't matter if you are doing Bible study. The Bible is saying that you and I can be changed by the power of God. So here's the angel. Let's go to the text. I'm done. So let's go to the text. Here's, so here's, here's the angel. Revelation 14. The angel is flying. Angel is flying. I'm, I'm flying in the midst of heaven. And the angel is flying a sign of speed. Revelation 14. Notice... He's flying, he's moving with speed and with precision, and he has in his, he has within him the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. What is the message? So what's the, more, what's the message? What's the warning in Revelation? Let's go to verse 7 of the text. It says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and what? Give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made the heavens, the earth, and the seas, and the fountains of... Notice what the angel is taking with him. He has the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. So I kind of ask myself, Sister Tessa, what, what is the subject of the everlasting gospel? You see, I, I, I have spent uh, six years doing a master's in theology, uh, studying about God. 
I've, I've spent uh, at almost 40 years of my life coming to church. So I have done many prayer meetings. Yes, I have preached many sermons. Yes, I've done many communions. Yes, I have done many things. But I want you to leave with this one reality, members and those online, the message of Revelation 14.7 is that sitting in the midst of all this fear, sitting in the midst of all that is coming is the everlasting gospel. Do you know what that is? The everlasting gospel is the good news that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life sitting in the story of the, uh, of the Revelation 14 is the good news that there's somebody called Jesus. Can I tell you about him? Let me tell you about him as I close. Uh, yes, you might think he's a New Testament Jesus, but that's not true because he's also an Old Testament Jesus. Remember Rahab. Rahab got a hold of the everlasting gospel. Many of you wouldn't even associate with Rahab. But when the everlasting gospel got hold of Rahab, she was willing to die. She says, listen, I've been doing all my life. Let me stop doing and let me get a hold of a man called Jesus. You know the story. As a matter of fact, if you read Matthew chapter 1, her name is there. She was nobody because she was doing. But when she started being, when she accepted Jesus vicariously, Jesus saved him. Remember the lady called Ruth in the Old Testament. Remember what she says? She says to Naomi, entreat me not to leave thee. For where thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge, but what shocked me, Peter, she says, your people shall be my people, and your God shall be, you see, she was doing all her life, but she recognized that for her to be changed, she has to be a part of the family of God. What a mighty God we serve. Remember Peter? Peter was a nobody, a fisherman, fishing and, and doing all his things, cursing his bad word. But when Jesus got a hold of him, Jesus said to him, Peter, Peter, the devil wants to sift you as wheat as you face the judgment. But he says, I have prayed for you. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren, we all have to stand before the judgment seat of God and doing won't help you. You need to be covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? Nobody wanted to touch her. Uh, she wasn't fit to attend church. She wasn't fit to go into the presence of God because the church door was locked according to the culture and the tradition. She was scarred, she was marred, and so for years she lived on the fringes, and so she was, she was doing, and the Bible says that she spent, I'm done now, she spent all that she had. But then she heard that Jesus was past sitting in Revelation 14, 7, is the everlasting gospel and this is the warning of it and she heard you know the story quite well don't have time to tell you but whilst the people were, were crowding around Jesus according to tradition she should have shout out unclean 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 and if anybody saw her because even her shadow would have made them unclean but her eyes were focused you know sometimes when others are doing for Jesus you just have to find Jesus she says if I I could but touch the hem of his garments. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Then I will be made whole. She stopped doing and start searching. And the Bible says when she touched him, she was made whole. Sitting in the middle of this message is the everlasting gospel. Remember Paul? A murderer. Um, nobody would give him the light of day. But Paul decided that he was going to kill 
all of God's children. I'm done. I'm seriously done. And you know what happened? As he was doing for God, you know the story. Read Acts chapter 9. And when God met him on the road to Damascus, Paul, Paul, why persecute me? Paul, Paul had a change of heart. You know what happened? And Paul worked for the Lord. And we know the text. He says, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. Judgment is coming. But sitting in the midst of judgment is Jesus, the everlasting gospel. So my question is, what is your relationship with Jesus this morning? How close are you to him? What is your life like with Jesus? Because even when you face the judgment, let me done now, bad English, even when you face the judgment, and I will face the judgment, and your names are called, Sister Rose, and you're standing, read, read Daniel 7, and you're standing before the judgment bar of God. And when God looked, Mother Saul, he's, God sees you. He sees a sinner. And all the deeds and all your deeds are popping up before the throne of God. Uh, Pastor Smith sinned. And, uh, Pastor Smith did this. Oh, and even then, you still need somebody. And that's why, that's why until I face the judgment, I will sing the song on a hill far away. I'll hold on to this. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And before the judgment bar of God, and my name has been called, and my sins are popping up, but I'm clinging, I'm holding to the cross. Because when God is about to stamp judgment, I shall throw the cross at his feet. And then he'll say, I'm going to exchange your cross with a crown. 